The iron lung was a prominent staple in medicine throughout the early to mid 1900s. It worked by pulling on the chest and forcing air into the lungs. However, since then, the iron lung has disappeared from medicine entirely. What was once an indispensable piece of equipment is now an obsolete hunk of metal. What could have caused such a dramatic shift in its use? Well, to find out, we're going to have to go way back in time to visit a very important man by the name of John Mayow. John Mayow is an English chemist. He specializes in respiration and is about to discover the relationship between breathing and air. Watch, as the mouse inhales, the water level rises, and as it exhales, the water lowers. It seems that upon inspiration, the mouse uses some of the nitro iris from within the container. Although this seems simple now, back then it was a big deal. Unfortunately, that's all we hear from John Mayo because he died five years later at the ripe old age of 38. Fast forward 158 years and we meet another John, Dr. John Biel. He notices that patients experiencing breathing difficulties could be assisted in their respirations by applying negative pressure to the body. To put this realization into practice, he constructs a big box. Attached to it are piston-powered bellows connected to a valve to evacuate the box of air. The person would sit in the box with their head exposed, and then the box would provide a rhythmic vacuum that expanded the chest, drawing in air into the lungs. This is Dr. Lewins, and he wants to put DL's invention to the test. Lewins puts some poor sap who drowned earlier that day into the box, then lights some candles under the man's nose. Very scientific. Despite the ridiculousness, the experiment worked. The man was able to blow out the candles with the assistance of the box. However, that's about all the action that DL's box had, because it was more of a proof of concept, if anything. So, let's move on. Dr. Ignaz von Hock is an Austrian doctor with a different approach to applying negative pressure to the chest. Rather than creating a large box, he made a device that only attached to the chest. This device applied constant negative pressure, so the chest was always expanded. To bring air into the lungs, he applied constant positive pressure via face mask. Overall, the system allowed for a larger chest capacity that was constantly full of air. Eventually, he realized that non-constant pressure worked better, which motivated him to create another chest-mounted device. Then yet another realization strikes him. It didn't work too well on kids, and it was kind of hard to strap someone in while they were flailing around. So he goes back to the tried and true method of the box. Instead of sitting, the person was able to lay down. How relaxing. About a year later, and a couple countries over, Dr. Voigt Les develops his own tank respirator. Hawk found out about this. He can't believe that Voigt Les is getting all the credit as creator of the tank respirator, where it should be he, Dr. Hawk, basking in the praise. He accuses Voilez of stealing his invention, but not much comes of this. So, poor Hawk never got his credit. But here's to you, Hawk. You did good. With the turn of the century, the Wright brothers are working on aviation, Ford is mass producing cars, and the Wizard of Oz is released. Things are looking good, but something isn't quite right. There is a mysterious paralytic disease that is on the rise. Its name, poliomyelitis or polio for short. This brings us to an outbreak in South Africa. Polio is rampant and causing respiratory failure in Dr. Stewart's patients. To combat this, he decides to create a respirator to help these people. It covers half the body and seals around the pelvis with wax. It is fitted with an electric motor, meaning that manpower is no longer needed. Instead, we can let electricity do the heavy work. And with the motor, Pulleys and belts are added, allowing for variable pressure and respiratory rates. Armed with his new invention, Dr. Stewart is ready to save some lives. Well, he would have been if his last patient hadn't died six hours ago. Better luck next time, Stewart. Now this is where things start to pick up. Over to America. The Consolidated Gas Company of New York asked a couple of Harvard, yeah, Harvard, engineers to produce a respirator. And they do. With the funding of the gas company, Philip Drinker and Louis Agassi Shaw construct a large metal tube fitted with two vacuum pumps powered by an electric motor. They refer to it as the iron lung. To test this invention, they anesthetize some cats and place them into the chamber. And that worked fine and all, but that wasn't good enough for them. No, no, no. So instead, next time, they poison the cats. 
The poison causes muscle relaxation so extreme that it causes the respiratory system to shut down. As the poison works its magic, the cat is placed into the tube, and sure enough, the cat lives. These experiments showed that the machine had huge potential and was destined for success, but there was just one problem. It was just too darn expensive. Q. John Emerson. He liked this new invention, but he saw some potential improvements that it could benefit from. He replaced those noisy vacuums with something quieter, added some fail-safes like a manual pump for when electricity went out, and a dual leather diaphragm so if one broke, the patient wasn't doomed. He simplified the mechanism that modified respiration rate and made it easier to open if there were an emergency. With all these improvements, you would think that the price would skyrocket, but actually, Emerson was able to do quite the opposite. He slashed the price in half. It costed a grand total of $1,000. Keep in mind, this is the 1930s, so that $1,000 translates to about $16,000 in today's money. But hey, any saved money is good money. Uh-oh, Drinker is back and he doesn't look too happy. And it looks like he has a lawsuit in his hand. No matter, Emerson can handle this. He basically says, you can't put a patent on a life-saving device. This argument worked so well, in fact, that not only did Emerson win the case, but he invalidated all of Dringer's patents. Now that is a power move. Six years later, we run into a familiar situation. It's another polio outbreak, but this time southern Australia is affected. Their health department asks both Edward and Donald Moth to create an iron lung that wasn't so expensive. The Moth brothers actually declined this offer, and no, I'm just kidding. Of course they accepted it and got to work. But with such a strict budget, why would you waste money on expensive materials like metal when you could just use plywood? This ingenious idea not only cut prices by 80%, but it also made it more maneuverable because it was now lightweight. And with the polio reaching pandemic levels, Moth's iron lung couldn't have come at a better time. Mass production began two years later. Moth respirators were being pushed out left and right lining up against hospital walls all over Europe. Demand was high, and it would remain high throughout the 1950s. Meanwhile, polio vaccines are being researched and distributed. The initiation of mass vaccination prevented further polio infections. Polio was finally on the decline. Good news for the world, but bad news for iron lung manufacturers. A sharp drop in polio patients meant a sharp drop in iron lung sales. Also, positive pressure ventilation was getting traction again with the advancements in intubation. Oxygen was able to be supplied directly into the lungs, and the whole setup only occupied the mouth and throat, whereas the iron lung obstructed the entire body. Although negative pressure ventilation was a non-invasive procedure, the new positive pressure method was more practical and cost-effective. This is pretty much why the negative pressure ventilator is no longer in use. Like all technologies, there will come a day when a new invention pushes its predecessor into the void of obscurity, binding it to a life of museum displays and cartoon gags. Alright, that's all. Big thanks to the person that made it to the end of this video. You're the true hero here. If you want to check out my other videos or social media platforms, that will be down in the description. If you have any suggestions for future videos, you can leave that in the comments, and feedback is always appreciated. But until next time, this is Klon's Clinic, and that is the outro music. <laughs>